Welcome to Copy Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DVS Group Research. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist, welcoming you to our 94th episode. As <laughs> ex-staff of the International Monetary Fund or the IMF, I have had many friends and colleagues uh, appear in Copy Time, uh, including Raghuram Rajan, Ann Kruger, Arvind Suramanian, Mark Sobel, but I've never had the pleasure of hosting a currently serving staff until today. Krishna Srivasan is the director of IMF's Asia and Pacific Department. In his nearly three decades with the organization, Krishna has had done it all, overseeing the work on China, South Korea, Brazil, Canada, Mexico, UK, and many more countries. Program surveillance, you take your pick. Krishna has also worked at the fund's research department, leading the IMF's work on the G20 in the context of the global financial crisis. Krishna Srinivasan, welcome to Kobe Time. Thank you, Tamar. Good to see you and good to meet with you. Good to see you too. And hopefully I get to see you in Asia sooner or later so that we can actually have a Kopi or coffee. Uh, yeah. I'm going to start with a housekeeping question. Asia, as the typical definition goes, stretches from the Pacific Islands to the east to Saudi Arabia and parts of Turkey to the west. What is the scope of coverage of the IMS Asia Department? Because I think I understand not all of Asia is covered by APD. Right. So, so uh, uh, Taimur, we have 37 countries in, in APD. And that, this covers the you know, large countries in China, India, Japan, to the small islands uh, in the in the Pacific. I mean, just in terms of put things in perspective, I think the countries covered by APD account for about 50% of world population and about 40% of uh, global GDP in PPP terms, right? And... Uh, I think uh, the, the countries which don't are not part of APD are countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan, which are in the Middle Eastern department. So we have 37 countries, which is about a fifth of the mem IMS membership, which is about at 190. And it has a bunch of countries ranging from the small to the very big. Right. So all of ASEAN, North Asia, Pacific Islands, yes. and a large chunk of South Asia, with the exception of yes. Pakistan, and then the Middle East is in the Middle Eastern Department. That's correct. Uh, got you. Uh, and Krishna, you have staff in both Washington, D.C. and in various parts of Asia. So give us a sense of how your work is divided between Asia location-wise, as well as your D.C.-based staff. Right. So, so Tamar, as you're very familiar, you know, the IMF mainly, you can think in terms of three strands of work, surveillance, lending and capacity development, right? So uh, if you look at what, how we divide us, uh, divide the department uh, into field-based and headquarters-based, we have, I think, resident, what we call as resident representatives in 13 countries. And then we also have uh, an, an office in Japan in Tokyo. It's called the Office of Asia and Pacific. And we also have three training centers, the, the Singapore Training Center, the one, the Sartec in, in India, and we have PIFTAC in the, in the Pacific Islands. So in terms of how we do the work, in comparison to, say, the World Bank, where 50 percent of staff are in the field, 50 percent of the quarters, I would say a very small proportion of our staff uh, are in the field. So say out of a, I would say we have a total staff strength of 160. I would say 20 are in the field. So we are much smaller compared to the World Bank when it comes to field office presence. That said, we coordinate very closely our work on both surveillance, uh, lending, and capacity development. And the role of rest reps becomes that much more important when you have a program. For instance, we have a program in Sri Lanka, uh, in Bangladesh, and so on. There, the, the resident representative becomes a very important player because she or he uh, really provides hands-on support to the country in the field, which is very important to make sure that there's you know, full information flow between the IMF and the country authorities in terms of what's expected of them, uh, the role of policies, and so on and so forth. Now, when it comes to surveillance, uh, again, they play a very important role by um, taking a message to the country and to the region. And again, when it comes to regional office, we have one in Japan, in Tokyo, which is you know really the hub for us. And they disseminate the research, they disseminate the surveillance across countries in the region, and so do the uh, tech centers. 
the the, the technical centers in Singapore, uh, India, and in the in the Pacific play a very very important role in providing capacity development support to all our members in that particular uh, region. For example, Sartec uh, uh, focuses on South Asia. Uh, you know, SCI is much broader, and so on and so forth. So again, it's uh, in, uh, depending upon the the program, depending upon our engagement as a program of surveillance, our rest reps play uh, you know roles which are very very important, strategic, and so on. Krishna, the World Bank has many very senior staff based in Asia. Do you have some of your senior staff based here? Yeah, we do. For example, we do have uh, what we call a senior resident representatives. Right now, we have them in three countries, uh, China, India, and Indonesia. All three are G20 countries, as you would imagine. And so we have senior uh, re resident representatives there. In other countries, we have uh, staff who are a bit more junior in terms of seniority and rank. Uh, but they play an equally important role and sometimes a more important role because they're in program countries uh, and so on. Absolutely. From my personal experience, having worked in some program countries, both in APD and elsewhere in IMF, the right. Western representatives were like a lifeline for the authorities to get a sense Absolutely. of what Washington was thinking. And, so and I think I think I think one one just one part is when we have a program with a country. For example, when we have a program with Bangladesh and with Nepal, uh, we usually appoint a resident representative uh, there so that they can be the, the liaison between the country and the IMF staff so that things work well in the program and so on. Right, absolutely. Uh, Krishna, last week here in Singapore, in fact, uh, the IMF uh, released an update of the global and regional outlook. So how is 23 looking? Let's talk a little bit about your top upside and downside risks. Right. So, uh, I mean, I'm, this is no, this won't be news to you, but, you know, the global economy is poised to slow this year before rebounding next year. So we have growth coming down from 3.4% in 2022 to 2.9% uh, in 2023, and then rebounds to 3.1%. But you know, generally speaking, growth will remain weak by historical uh, standards as a fight against inflation and the war in Ukraine continues. Those, those are both headwinds to growth. Uh, but despite, despite these headwinds, I would say that we are less gloomy than we were, say, two, three months ago in October. And that's partly because, I mean, why are we, why are we being, uh, I would say, what's the right word, cautiously optimistic, is because I think we have made some... Uh, We've had some success on all three fronts. Uh, in Q3 in 2022 was very resilient. So that gave a, lip, a huge fillip to the world economy. Uh, uh, and, and labor markets are strong, notably in the US. And that's you know, really beefed up, uh, helped uh, increase consumption demand, investment demand. We've, inflation is coming down. I mean, headline, headline inflation for sure is coming down. So that's provided some support to the economy. And finally, uh, global financial conditions have also eased across. So that gives me uh, uh, some optimism that uh, 2023 could be the year of turning points where growth bottoms out and inflation uh, kind of peaks. Now, the question, of course, is what does it mean for the region? I guess you want to go talk about the region. I think the same kind of cautions optimism carries forward to the region. And again, if you were to ask me what is something different this time around in, in Asia, I think the main thing is China, right? With China opening up uh, from, it had a zero COVID strategy for a long time. It's opened up. In fact, it opened, it's opened up faster than we expected, more quickly than we expected. So that's providing a huge boost to consumption, so to, to growth this year. So in 2023, we expect growth in China at 5.2%. Uh, which is 3% what, what we had in 2022, which was very low compared to Chinese standards, right? So in 2023, we have 5.2%. You, you add that to a, a, slight, uh, a slight uptick in our growth forecast for Japan at 1.8% and India at 6.1%. So these three countries are really the engine of growth uh, for the region and for the global economy. In fact, uh, Tamar, I don't know whether you notice it, but China and India together account for 50% of global growth in 2023, which is quite significant, right? So I think that's the, that's a story for the globe and for the region. In terms of risks, uh, again, uh, it's a very pertinent question. I would say the risks are similar to the upside and downside. So if, for instance, uh, we've had China opening up, right? So if China opens up, if consumption picks up, if mobility picks up and consumption picks up very strongly, then you could have a much bigger impact 
uh, on global growth and the region, right? Uh, again, if inflation comes on faster and global financial conditions ease uh, uh, more, then you could see a big upside to, to the global economy. On the other hand, if China, uh, the opening up leads to new viruses, uh, new, new strands, and if things slow down, mobility doesn't pick up, that could be a headwind to growth. If the war uh, you know, escalates further, that could be a, a, a downside risk to growth. So there are both upside and downside risks to growth. And I think that's where uh, we are in a very interesting field. But I think overall, I would say that we are um, a bit more optimistic than we were, say, two, three months ago. So, Krishna, if I understand correctly, your developed market growth forecast for 23 is lower than 22, but your emerging market forecast, particularly around the China narrative that you just described, is somewhat right. higher in 23 than 22. Um, we, we saw interest rates go up substantially last year. That created tightness in liquidity. That had a lot of problem, created a lot of problem in emerging market economies. Interest rates will remain high this year. If anything, maybe in real terms, they'll go up because inflation is falling. That is not a big source of worry for you? So so uh, let me just answer that question first. So if you look at emerging markets, and in, in fact, if you look at emerging markets in Asia, you still have, you know, headline inflation has come down, but core inflation is still above uh, central bank targets. So the advice would be to stay the course, right? So that uh, inflation comes on a more durable basis uh, because of the worst kind of tax you can think of. So you want inflation to come down, core inflation to come down. So that is going to be a drag uh, on, on some economies, right? At the same time, you also have the China factor, which comes into play. External demand is, is improving in for some of these countries. So that provides some support. So on the one hand, you have uh, interest rates, which are likely to tighten, but you also have the China factor, which is going to give a big fillip to some countries, for instance, which are tightly linked to the Chinese market, right? I think we are still, you know, uh, we still haven't fully absorbed the impact of what China's opening up means and the path of China opening up for some countries in the region. Uh, uh, you know, we had, when we made the revisions to China, we had teams which were already finalizing the numbers. So there's some more work to be done our part to see how the China opening up bears upon prospects for countries in the region. So that could be a big plus. And if, sorry, and if, uh, and, 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 and if, uh, uh, you know, commodity prices come down uh, and so on, it, it all provides further fill up to the uh, economic prospect. But yes, inflation is still a, it's still a concern. We want policies to uh, address that. Uh, when it comes to, uh, I talked about monetary policy, but in fiscal policy too, we want fiscal policy to go hand in glove with monetary policy. So we want more targeted support being provided to countries. Uh, so some of that, in fact, some of the countries have given uh, support, which may kind of wane off this year. So you will see some drag going into 2024. Right. So related to that, uh, we had to spend a lot of money on emergency basis in 2020 and 2021, and we saw debt ratios go up substantially at the sovereign level in many emerging market countries, and of course, substantially in developed markets as well. So the world's indebtedness is significantly greater today than a couple of years ago. You're advocating some degree of rationalization of fiscal positions. But um, I go back to my earlier point of interest rates going up in real terms this year. Does that worry you that maybe our absorptive capacity is not that much, given that how much debt we have added in the last couple of years? Yeah, I think, I mean, in fact, I would say, uh, uh, time. I think debt has gone up across many regions of the world, but right. particularly so in Asia. Right, I think if I if I remember num the right numbers, I think it's gone from twenty five percent to thirty eight percent. That's a big uh, increase in debt, and 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 uh, you know our advice to countries as both in the near term you have to provide support, but provide targeted support to the poor and vulnerable. But over a period, over the medium term, many of these countries have to embark on fiscal consolidation, which not just because you have. Uh, use of a lot of fiscal space uh, addressing the pandemic and the war and so on. But you have longer term challenges in terms of aging population, climate and so on. So the fiscal stance uh, for a lot of countries in Asia has to be towards greater consolidation, both in the near term, but targeted support to the poor and vulnerable. But over the medium term, a lot more. I think I would say that many countries in the region uh, would, would need that. And, and and so that is going to have an impact on you know longer term prospects uh, growth uh, moderation and so on. 
Uh, later in this podcast, I'd like to do some country by country overview yeah. with you. And at that time, I'd like to bring back the debt issue, especially in the context of Japan and China. But before yeah. we go there, uh, Krishna, uh, you have two uh, rather high profile program cases right now, uh, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Uh, let's talk about those programs a little bit. So, so Bangladesh, we just approved a, a program for Bangladesh, which uh, is a is a I think it's an ECF EFF uh, uh, for I want to get the exact numbers right. It's about three point three billion uh, for Bangladesh, which is you know as, as you know, uh, time or you've been in the fund. Uh, it's what we call as a, a full fund support program, a UCD program. On top of that, we also have provided. Uh, uh, Bangladesh, what is called an RST, which from from which we have 1.4 billion uh, to support uh, Bangladesh economic policies. Again, uh, I must give credit to Bangladesh. Uh, they saw, I mean, they were like many other countries in the region, many of the country, many other emerging markets. They were affected by the back to back crisis, the pandemic and the war and so on. So they did take a huge terms of trade shock, which uh, had a bearing on they are uh, macro uh, stability, macro growth, uh, external pressure, and so on. So they, they saw this uh, coming, and so they were proactive in reaching out to us for a program to stabilize the economy, to have uh, durable growth, and address more longer-term structural reforms. At the same time, they, the Bangladesh is one country which is hugely affected by climate change. And they were the first country to ask for uh, support under the Resilience and Sustainability Trust which is a new instrument from the fund. Uh, it's a long, long-term long uh, instrument. Right now, it's aimed at addressing climate change and pandemic preparedness. So in some sense, Bangladesh is trying to address both the near-term problems and longer-term challenges. And you know, some, somewhere in between, you also have these medium-term challenges. So this is a program which could addresses both the near-term and the longer term challenges. And the idea here is, in addition, I mean, uh, you, you know this very well, that the IMF's role is more of a catalytic creditor, right? So the IMF comes in, you have other creditors like the ADB, the World Bank coming in. So it provides uh, Bangladesh with, with sufficient resources to address the challenges they're facing right now, both in terms of macro stability uh, and you know, uh, anchoring strong and durable growth and addressing longer term challenges. Uh, Krishna, before we go to Sri Lanka, just a couple of follow-ups. So different funds, so traditional uh, balance of payment support, as well as uh, this new resilience and sustainability trust, but the conditionalities under the program are the same, that the disbursement from these different financing facilities would be subject to the same sort of conditionalities, or would it be like different sort of disbursement schedule and requirements? So the conditionality varies, right? For the for the UCT program, which is your traditional fund program, you would have conditionality which links to what's been the underlying cause of the problem, right? So if there is a, a problem, there is a BOP problem. What is the underlying cause? If it's a fiscal, let's address the fiscal uh, challenges. And so trying to address the whole issue of mobilizing revenue, uh, scaling up social spending, because you also want to protect the, the poor and vulnerable. So in many of these countries and many of these programs now, we have explicit conditionality on scaling up social spending. So you have something similar to that in the program. And then, you know, uh, modernizing the monetary framework. So all these are what you would think as quintessential uh, policies which underpin a, a UCD program. But also now you have uh, the, the, the RST will be geared towards putting in place policies which can alleviate, uh, you know, climate challenges, which will also help uh, bring in climate finance. So the, the the conditionality varies across these things, but one is more in terms of addressing the climate challenges or the pandemic preparedness, depending on which country you're looking at. And so, and so the, the the conditionality is slightly different uh, in the second and for the RSC thing. It's more geared towards addressing the climate challenge, getting climate financing into the country, uh, you know, regulatory policy, which would things which would actually entice the private sector coming. So that's the slight difference there. So could one program go off track and the trust fund related uh, disbursements continue? Well, it, it depends upon how, what what we mean by going tra- going off track. So, in, in, you know, as you know, uh, Timur, in many cases, there are some things which go off track, some things which can be brought back. So I think there is enough flexibility in the program to make sure that they work together. But uh, uh, I, maybe I should at this point talk about the RST. The RST is a, is a third pillar of lending of the IMF, right? We, you know, as you know, we have the the general resources account, which provides financing to all, uh, you know, 
develop, non-developing, so developed countries and so on, emerging markets and so on. Then you have the PRGF, which provides financing to uh, the low-income developing countries. Now you have the RST, which is a third pillar, which provides longer-term financing. It's a 20-year instrument with a 10 and a half years grace addressed towards pandemic preparedness and uh, climate change. So it's in that context. So we have sufficient flexibility to ensure that the programs go together. Bangladesh is the first country which has asked for a program under the RST. All the other programs which, which have gotten resources of the RST have been top-ups. So Bangladesh is the first one which is uh, getting a, pro, a UCD program with the RST. Um, in the last two decades, Krishna, most crises uh, globally, at least, have yeah. come from the financial sector. So this intersection between financial stability and economic stability seem to become more and more pronounced as the world gets more financialized. Um, so in countries like Bangladesh or even Sri Lanka, and we, I would like to talk to you about Sri Lanka momentarily, where you know they're not exactly advanced economies in terms of financial market depth or you know spillovers to the rest of the world but it still matters you know dollar liquidity and external funding and stuff like that um so what's your sense of financial stability in bangladesh because my understanding is their currency has taken quite a bit of a knock over the last year because of adverse terms of trade effect and there are questions about you know like the reserve adequacy and so on so again when we look at the program there, right? So we looked at what's happened to uh, the balance of payment, what's happened to the exchange rate, what's happened to, uh, you know, many of these countries, again, not Bangladesh specific, they could have leverage uh, in various uh, sec uh, balance sheets. So the whole idea here is to see what does all of this mean for financial sector stability? So one part of a program also focuses on strengthening the financial sector both through you know, whether they have sufficient amount of capital, where, where do you have any, uh, uh, any, any, any shortcomings. So our programs also geared towards addressing the financial sector stability part. And that's true for both um, uh, uh, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. In fact, I think one aspect of Asia in general is that there is quite a, a big feedback loop between the sovereign and the, and the banks. Yeah. So in, in countries where we don't have programs, we are actually strengthening our surveillance to look at that part of systemic risk. Is leverage in the corporate sector or the banks or the households, how does that bear upon you know, economic prospects? So in many countries, we're looking to see if house prices are correcting right and a lot of and there is large amount of household debt what does it mean for financial stability what does it mean for economic stability so that's in the context of surveillance in the context of programs you actually can address that more proactively by saying that you have this problem address the gap in your balance sheet and so on so that's a very intrinsic part of all our programs both bangladesh and sri lanka to make sure that it is not just focused on growth and the BOP, but also and the, and the fiscal, but also the financial sector is heart and center of how we monitor the country. Okay, let's talk about Sri Lanka. Yeah, so Sri Lanka is is uh, is facing a severe economic crisis. Uh, we are deeply uh, we are deeply concerned with what's happening, the impact of the economic uh, crisis on the people. We've seen social unrest. You've all seen it in last summer, right? And on September one of twenty twenty two, we reached a soft level agreement. Uh, with Sri Lanka on a 48-month arrangement uh, under the external fund facility. And so this is about, about 3 billion, right? And the reform is built on very strong policy measures addressed uh, at raising government revenue to ensure fiscal sustainability, uh, introducing cost recovery, energy pricing, uh, restoring price stability by modernizing the, the monetary framework, rebuilding foreign reserves, uh, safeguarding financial stability, which I talked about, and strengthening the social safety nets. Because in every program time, we are trying to ensure that the poor and vulnerable get our, our address, are taken care of. Because some of these programs do, do involve uh, conditions which can be hard. So we want to make sure that the, the poor and vulnerable are protected. And we also want to look at corruption, vulnerabilities, governance, and so on. So this program in Sri Lanka is is what we would I would call a full uh, enchilada, and since it has, covers many aspects of it. Uh, the problem there is, as you know, Sri Lanka's debt is unsustainable. So for the fund to lend or for the executive board of the IMF to approve a program, the debt has to, made, has to be made sustainable. So we are at that point where um, uh, we are trying to get assurances from bilateral creditors, making sure that Sri Lanka is making good faith efforts with private creditors so that 
debt can be made sustainable on a forward-looking basis. So once that is assured, we can go to the board uh, with the program for, for Sri Lanka. But that's where we are right now. Um, you now, in the past, uh, for really you know heavily indebted countries, there have been initiatives like the HIPIC initiative, heavily inde uh, indebted countries initiatives. There have been Paris Club and so on. Um, the sort of sovereign debt balance of payments crisis that we have seen, not just in your APD countries, but elsewhere over the last few years, is there scope for a, sort of a multilateral roundtable like a Paris club to deal with these things? Or life is a little more complicated. There are a lot of bilateral aspects which simply doesn't lend themselves to multilateral approaches. So, so you're, you're familiar, Kramer, uh, with the common framework. The common framework has been put in place for, for low-income countries where they can come to the uh, com use the common framework to resolve the debt situation. Uh, the Unfortunately, the common framework does not apply to a country like Sri Lanka, but it's a middle-income country. So we have to think in terms of what could be the right kind of framework. Now, you did talk about, you touched upon one, one particular aspect. I mean, the world has evolved a lot since... Um, the HIPIC and so on and so forth. Right now, we have we have countries which have which have debt to private creditors. They have debt to bilateral creditors, some of whom are in the Paris Club, some of whom are non-Paris Club. And then you have, of course, the MDBs and so on. So when you talk about debt restructuring, the complication hits is how do you coordinate uh, mm -hmm. the Paris Club creditors with the non-Paris Club creditors? And that's the kind of issue you deal with, you're dealing with in many countries. So at this point in time, we are working within the frameworks we have the common framework, common framework for, for low-income countries, which, of course, there are efforts to make it more efficient, more uh, expeditious, and so on. But also, we have to think in terms of the frameworks we have in place to resolve debt restructuring, uh, debt problems uh, faced by countries like Sri Lanka. So we are working with that. In the case of Sri Lanka, we have all the creditors you can think of, private creditors, uh, uh, Paris Club creditors, non-Paris Club creditors, uh, MDBs, domestic creditors. So there are many, there are many creditors at play here. So we are trying to, uh, uh, again, the fund cannot get involved in the debt restructuring process itself. What it does is it provides the overall macro framework, uh, looks at what is the debt target which can which can uh, lead you to sustainability and so on. And that provides the framework for the, for the debtor country, in this case, Sri Lanka, to negotiate with its creditors. So that's where we are uh, on Sri Lanka. Very, very interesting. Uh, so just to be clear, the fund remains the lead agency in, as far as the sustainability analysis, the arithmetic of sustainability, that sort of forecasts and analysis and scenarios are prepared by the IMF when these sort of multilateral discussions are taking being take, are taking place? Yeah, I think it is one area where we have a, a real competitive advantage is our debt sustainability frameworks are, are, very, uh, are very modern state of the art. So we have a good uh, way to, to analyze a country's debt situation to see when uh, a debt problem is sustainable, when it is not. They oftentimes, uh, people will, will, you know, it's not very obvious to the common person why do we judge one country's debt to be unsustainable and not the other one. But we have these frameworks which are very sophisticated, which kind of tell you, okay, right now you may not be sustainable. Debt is not sustainable. What needs to be done going forward? So that's where the kind of uh, the, the fund has the expertise to say what are the parameters which can get you to a sustainable level of debt. And like I, like I mentioned before, the IMF cannot lend to an unsustainable debt situation. So we wait for the debt to be made sustainable on a forward-looking basis before we go ahead uh, and lend money to them, to a country. Uh, uh, that is very well understood and appreciated that in terms of you know, fiscal parameters and debt sustainability, the analytical framework that the fund has developed, those tools remain best practice. Now, we were talking about the Resiliency, Resilience and Sustainability Trust earlier. Uh, as sort of we go forward, climate change related work is going to become more and more integral to your day to day work. Uh, so what kind of best practices and analytical tools will you be using? So, again, uh, that's a very good question, uh, Tamar. So the RST uh, kind of provides you, uh, you can think in terms of a, of a a macro fiscal climate framework, which kind of internalizes the climate risks a country has mm. uh, into a uh, into a uh, into a into a traditional macro framework we've used we've used in the past. Also, right. So now what we're doing is we are trying to integrate climate risks into our macro framework. 
We are trying to analyze, we're trying to integrate climate risk and so our assessment of financial sector stability for banks and so on in the context of our, you know, FSAPs, you know, the financial sector assessment programs we have. So in every sense of the word, we're trying to bring in climate risks risk explicitly into our analysis, both whether it's the macro or the financial. Right, and in the case in the, in the context of countries which which seek out um, uh, support from the RST, that framework provides you um, uh, the kind of credibility you need to also catalyze uh, financing from the private sector. I mean, everybody recognizes the fact that addressing the challenge of climate, uh, the climate change uh, climate change challenge, would require huge amounts of private sector money coming in. The public sector on its own cannot do it. So the question is. Can you think in terms of a framework which can, which is credible, which the private sector finds credible and realistic, so that they can come in? And what are the kind of reforms you can address in that framework, which entices the, uh, which allows the uh, the private sector to come in? So that's the kind of analysis we're doing: uh, integrating climate risks, looking at what keeps the private sector away, what can be done to alleviate that, uh, and and you. In some sense, I create the kind of enabling environment for the private sector to come in, along with climate funds, along with you know the other IFIs to help a country address uh, uh, the challenge of climate change. Great, good to hear about that. Uh, we here at DBS also remain very sort of passionately involved in in some of these issues. Uh, yeah, I'm supposed to be at the forefront on this, and you guys also have been at the forefront of this. In fact, there is work ongoing at the fund on trying to. Uh, you know, work with the private sector to see how we could bring in private sector to address the uh, climate challenge, uh, uh, climate change challenge. Right. Uh, you may not be aware of this, but I'm actually working with some of your staff on this issue too. Uh, you will see a working paper one of these days. Um, uh, Krishna, uh, you cover 37 countries in your department. I'd love to talk about all of them, but certainly not possible. So I have chosen a list of five countries that I'd like to discuss with you, and maybe we can go one by one. Uh, Japan used to be boring and has become very exciting in the last few months. Uh, so what's your sense of yield curve control? What's your sense of Japan dealing with fiscal sustainability if indeed rates start going up? So let, let's start with the economic, the growth numbers. So uh, growth is 1.4% up uh, in uh, 2022. And it, it reflects a weaker external demand and the disappointing GDP, GDP outturn in the third quarter. I think Japan is one country where the third, third quarter outturns were weaker than one had expected. In many other countries, the Q3 was very good. In Japan, it wasn't the case. Uh, but then we forecast uh, uh, growth in 2020 to be 1.8%. And that's partly reflecting the fact that um, uh, there is pent up demand. There are supply chain improvements. Uh, the country has opened up uh, for after the pandemic. And there is broad monetary and fiscal policy support. So 1.8% is, I think we have revised our numbers from the, from the uh, October World Economic Outlook. Now, inflation in Japan has also risen very high, and it's, I think it's um, highest in four decades and so on. But our baseline assumes that inflation will come back to 2% by end 2024, right? So the question then is, um, uh, you've always seen this case in Japan where inflation can go up, but it comes below 2%. So there's never been the case where you've had inflation durably at or above the 2% target. So it's in that context, one has to see the, the yield control framework. <clears throat> and so our advice has been to, to keep the monetary policy accommodation in place so that inflation can come back uh, to 2% on a durable basis. And that's where uh, a lot of discussion has taken place because they've had, they have, they have had episodes in the past where inflation looks is coming up and it's quickly gone back. So I think that's the risk they want to avoid. So it's in that context one sees the yield control uh, framework. And, uh, you know, in the past several months, they have been buying a lot of the 10 year and five year GGBs. So uh, I think almost 70% of that is held by the central bank. So the question was there were some issues of market functioning and so on. So in December, they allowed the, uh, the, 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 the yields to rise, and that's partly related to market functioning and so on and so forth. And that also, the kind of flexibility you have there is good, just in case there is, um, you know, upside risks to inflation. This, you know, allowing flexibility is good in that sense. So that's what that's been our advice to them. And uh, in terms of the fiscal, you know, they have provided support, but some of the support has been not targeted. So, 
like other countries, we would also like Japan to provide more targeted support in the fiscal term, in, in, the, in, the, in, sorry, in the near term. But going beyond that, I think they have a challenge in terms of uh, you know, an aging population and a longer term climate change and so on. So the fiscal going forward has to be uh, a lot more, uh, there has to be a lot more mid term consolidation. So that's the kind of uh, advice we're having in, uh, for, for Japan. And you don't worry about debt sustainability given the large wealth uh, of, of that nation. So, so at this point, it depends upon the, the who holds the debt, also, right? So, in that context, when you talk, when you talk about debt sustainability, it's also looking at who holds the debt and so on. But you know, one, when debt rises uh, at a very fast level, you do worry about it. But the question here is that's why we're talking about you know, have a very uh, well thought out, credible and realistic medium term fiscal framework that can kind of anchor, you know, sustainability on a forward looking basis. Right. Um, Krishna, you have in your earlier part of your career devoted quite a bit of time to China. And of course, now that country probably matters as much as any other major countries in the world, be it, you know, US or Europe or so on. Um, and, and again, just like Japan, it's become rather interesting to follow over the last couple of months with the reopening. Uh, walk us through your view on China. So China, I mean, again, uh, like you said, uh, it's it's become very interesting to work on China, especially now with the, when they, when they lifted the COVID restrictions, they did it uh, you know, much faster than what expect, anybody expected, what we expected before in, in, in October 2022. And, and so that has implication, like I mentioned of, uh, at the beginning. So you had growth at 3% in, in, at the end of uh, in 2022. And given the fact that it opened up the economy, we expect, uh, you know, mobility to return. Uh, earlier, we thought mobility and consumption would be returning, but much more backloaded. Now we brought all of that forward. So we have, uh, you know, mobility and consumption picking up uh, in the first half of 2023. So growth at 5.2%. And then uh, we bring, I think we bring it down to 4.5% in 2024. Uh, again, in the case of China, all this is good, but they have some serious structural headwinds. I think one issue here is the real estate sector. On the real estate sector, you know, they it was the three red flags they had in terms of reducing leverage. I think that was good. That was spot on. But the question is that, of course, has led to contagion, you know, started with Evergrande and stock. It's gone to other developers. We have not seen a, a coherent and cogent response to the real estate crisis. And we feel a lot more can be done at the central government level and to, to provide support uh, to the real estate sector, which is a huge part of Chinese economy. And we're so confident in the sector. So I think that's in headwind. So despite the fact that they've opened up and the economy is picking up and so on, there is a structural, uh, there is this issue of the real estate sector, which kind of a serious headwind. And going forward, we've also revised down our medium term forecasts for, for, for China to, to below 4%. And that partly relates to the fact that productivity has been coming down very sharply. Uh, and so they need to, you know, open up the economy, uh, you know, allow greater competition between the state-owned enterprise and the private sector and so on. So those things are work in progress. But given the fact that productivity has been on a secular decline, we've revised down our uh, medium-term numbers to below 4%. So that, in a nutshell, is a China story. Time, let, me, let me conclude by saying that they do have the policy space. This is a country where inflation remains muted, so they can provide uh, support. But what we've argued is more than monetary policy, the fiscal policy support geared towards boosting consumption, because that would that would really rebalance the economy. It would also help address the climate challenge they face. So in some sense, this is something we've been telling them for some time, and they can do it, and they can provide more, more targeted transfers, boost consumption, but that's what happened. They're putting a lot more emphasis on on the public infrastructure side. So that's where it's making the imbalance, uh, 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 you know, it's not correcting the imbalance you had, and that also can bear upon uh, how they address the climate challenge. That was going to be my follow-up questions and you just took it away from me. Uh, Krishna, one question on China, but not necessarily within China, but its external impact is related to inflation. So 12 years ago, when the world was going through a big global financial crisis, China was still growing robustly and we saw oil prices uh, find a lot of support because China's demand was substantial. Is this reopening dynamic that we're seeing in China could be a source of upside risk to demand for commodities and therefore inflation in 2023? It could well be. Could well be. I, 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 
we are looking at those we are looking at that analysis right now but uh, like i said there's an upside to growth uh, from china opening up 5.2% the question is what does it mean for oil and commodity prices what we've seen in the past is when china has grown very fast commodity prices have gone up that supported economies in latin america where i used to work before so the question is can you will that be repeated now or are there are there other mitigating slowdowns in other countries which overall impact maybe not so much but i still think that is an upside risk to inflation uh, in 2023 and 2024 it all depends about how the rest of the world evolves uh, yeah but that's that's a fair question Yeah the markets remain very relaxed about it but we are somewhat uh, more worried than what the market based indicators seem to suggest uh, yeah. out of this issue so yeah we'll have to watch that space as they say uh, Krishna India everybody's favorite emerging market story a lot of growth potential but in the last few weeks some corporate governance related issues coming up to the fore um tell us about your uh, assessment on India So on India um, you know supported by external factors India is expected to be on the fastest growing uh, re- economies this year I think we have it at 6.1%. Uh we we haven't changed our numbers from what we had time or in October. So it's going to project it's projected 6.1% 2023 rising to 6.8% uh, and there's sufficient uh resi- there actually there's a lot of resilient domestic demand which is actually pumping the which is pushing the economy. Uh uh inflation was rising quite sharply. The Reserve Bank of India was tightening policies appropriately to bring inflation down. I think it's not moderated to 5.7% in December, which is below the RBI's 4 plus minus 2 uh, tolerance band. So I think they they have growth uh, uh which is quite robust. So uh it is a, a relative bright spot and uh inflation is still elevated it's come down i would still think that the onus would be on the, on, on on the reserve bank to keep um uh you know policy uh, tight so that uh, you know inflation comes down on a more durable basis uh on the fiscal side i think the the budget was it was was uh, did not i mean there was there was some fear in markets that because next year is an election year there would be a lot of freebies and so on but i think they have held uh, they made it very responsible so i think the the budget was very responsible uh in terms of fiscal consolidation they made many changes to uh, income income tax side put a lot of emphasis on on capex which i think they believe that it has higher multipliers to bring in the private sector so i think that's that's geared well the questions whether the states respond to the increase in capex that's something which you have to see uh in terms of corporate gowns yes we have seen the recent uh, uh issues in with one of the conglomerates i think uh so far the impact on the market has been limited i think uh, uh i've i've seen uh the ministry of finance talk about the fact that this is limited to one conglomerate there are the, the regulatory agency is doing its job let it do its job so so far the limit the spillovers have been limited but we are watching uh, we are watching situation monitoring the situation carefully and again i think um even for country like india i mean there are medium term challenges uh, both in terms of uh, you know what needs to be done social safety nets uh, in terms of climate change so the fiscal they have to have a a, a, a well fleshed out credible realistic medium term f- fiscal framework i think that's that would be really a big plus if they have that but other than, other than that i think as at this point in time it is it is a bright spot uh, you know and along with china accounts for 50% of global growth this year so that tells you something indeed indeed uh, krishna when i covered india at the imf way back when uh one striking thing that i used to notice was that the central government's total spending on interest expenditure uh was equal or more than total spending on health and education my understanding is that that dynamic hasn't changed that much uh now you talk about fdi upside uh we read a lot about this whole china plus one policy by many companies likely to benefit india substantially if we're going to see a very big pickup in manufacturing which is i think what the government also wants um w- do we have sufficient good quality human capital to be deployed to support that manufacturing it's a good question at time or i let me be honest i don't know the answer as to um, i've heard uh, i've heard others talk about the fact that uh, given not with saying the fact that we produce many engineers how many of them are employed and so on i think it will be important for all these countries to in, to in, to invest more in education uh, to increase the skills base and i think that's extremely important uh, because if you want to be a recipient of um, 
uh, the kind of manufacturing uh, relocation away from China or in the services relocation uh, or services boost, you want to have uh, good skills. So I think it's important to invest in, uh, in, in good education and skills. I think that has to be done. Uh, I think in terms of, in terms of um, uh, moving, when countries think about, companies think of moving away from China, I think China, India has, uh, India is well-placed to take advantage of that. I think the big debate is whether India should, um, focus more on services uh, rather than manufacturing. To me, that's a false debate. I think you can focus on both mm -hmm. because in terms of the multipliers for job generation, uh, manufacturing is a lot higher. So in a, in a country which has just become the largest, uh, world's largest uh, in terms of population and a lot of uh, youth uh, looking to jobs, I think we have to move on both fronts, into both in terms of uh, manufacturing and services. And I think whether you do uh, uh, and whatever you do in terms of the business environment has to get better and skills base, I think it's very, very important. So the more you invest in education and retooling the, the labor force, the bigger the dividends down the road. Absolutely. Uh, Krishna, India is hosting the G20 this year. Last year's host was Indonesia. So let's uh, talk a little bit about Indonesia. So, so Indonesia is one of these countries uh, which I was following very closely. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, real GDP is a growth is estimated to grow at 5.3% in 2022, right? And I think this was supported by high commodity prices. <clears throat> growth expected to moderate uh, to 4.8% in 2023. And why is that? It's reflecting a combination of um, policies which have become tighter. Monetary policy has gone up, or they tightened by 225 basis points, I think, to, I think it's a 5.75, the policy rate. Uh, and fiscal policy has also tightened. So, uh, and they, they will not come back because the fiscal policy was actually overperforming. They've been able to uh, come back to their earlier, uh, they've been able to come back to a 3% deficit ceiling earlier than expected. So I think uh, Indonesia is one country which is well-placed uh, to do well. And I think um, in terms of policies, they're doing the right thing. They had, uh, there was some amount of uh, direct monetary financing uh, during the pandemic years. They rolled that back. They have tightened fiscal. They've tightened monetary. I think they're now well, they're well-placed. And I think if, um, if things slip a little bit on growth, they do have the space to support. So I think overall, I think uh, Indonesia is well placed. And in terms of <coughs> policy recommendations, I think we would say keep your eye on inflation because you don't want inflation to come down and suddenly go up. So you want inflation. Keep your eyes on that. Allow the exchange rate to be uh, uh, to move. You know, many of the countries in Asia, uh, you know, uh, you know, are worried about exchange rate uh, movements. But I think allowing exchange rate to be flexible, these circumstances is good. And uh, yeah, so I would say that Indonesia is quite well placed uh, today to to reap the benefits when the economy picks up. Perhaps drawing a thread from the conversation that we had on India, uh, what's your sense of? their strategy to attract a lot of FDI. I've seen some headlines on the high value added on the metal sector and trying to become a hub for electric vehicle. Uh, so are you observing some real momentum behind uh, structural policies to boost employment through investment in manufacturing? Yes, I think they are They are using both the, the climate debate and the durable high growth debate to move towards high value added sectors. Uh, and they are trying to see in a world where uh, there could be uh, uh, capital coming out of China and moving to other countries, they want to be a recipient. So I think they're doing a lot of good, th good things there. And I think the overall macro also provides the key indicator, right, for any investor. So I think they're working on that. So I think overall, I think they are uh, uh, geared towards uh, doing well going forward. Okay, so we talked about four very large Asian economies with a combined population of around 3 billion. I want to finish this conversation by talking about a country of five and a half million, my yes. old backyard, Singapore, where you have been to many, many times, Krishna, and I hope to see you there here soon again. Uh, tell us a bit about IMS assessment on Singapore's current state. So in, uh, I think Singapore, uh, I think we have the growth at 3.7% in 2022. I'm not sure it's changed a lot since we last did our forecast. And it, is, it was back on the positive surprise. I think 
consumption was better than we expected in, in, the, in the third quarter. Like I was saying, many countries did very well in the third quarter, except maybe for Japan. But I think Singapore, the third quarter came out very strong. So I think that kind of helped provide a uh, flip to a growth, which came at 3.7%. We, we forecast some slowing in, in 2023 and reflecting weakening external demands from some key trading partners. And I think the external headwinds are expected to weigh on growth uh, for, for Singapore. I think even domestically, seeing some of the major trade-oriented sectors like semiconductors are expected to slow a little bit because of what's the external headwinds. Uh, inflation uh, has been uh, rising quite rapidly because of transportation energy prices, but uh, I think headline inflation is about 6.2% uh, before falling to 5.8%. So inflation is on the higher side, and they have to keep an eye on that. So continue uh, you know, tightening monetary policy. And I think in terms of the fiscal support, uh, you want to be make it. You want to make it a lot more targeted uh, on uh, uh, and and uh, to address to go hand in glove with monetary policy. I mean, Singapore has enough fiscal space. So if growth really uh, stumbles, then you have the fiscal space to provide uh, uh, support. But at this point in time, uh, I think this is a, it's it's a it's a, it's a it's a beacon of macro stability, right? Uh, Singapore has always been. So I think they're doing the right things. Uh, but uh, keep an eye on inflation, not you know wishing away too much, and you know keep that focus. I think that's true for all of Asia, and we're seeing that uh, in particular because headline inflation is definitely coming down, but core inflation across the region, including the small countries, is about target. So let's keep focus on inflation and fiscal going hand in glove with with, uh, with monetary policy. But at the same time, recognizing the fact that some people need to be supported, provide the targeted support, and if things fall quite sharply on growth, you have the fiscal space. So you're on a, you're on a kind of a good spot, I would say. Krishna, when you were talking about India, you made a very interesting point, which is you don't have to have a trade-off between excellence in services and excellence in manufacturing. Singapore is a classic example where the country has consistently moved up the value chain and maintained a decent manufacturing footprint, even though it's very wealthy on a per capita basis. And nobody would be surprised if it became like Hong Kong, like, you know, almost right. all of the GDP comes from services. But the country chose not to. Um, I just want you to sort of think about this question in the context of China. Uh, you, as an organization, for decades have advocated that you know China focus more on consumption and uh, less on sort of heavy investment and so on. But the Singapore example, which is to hold on to manufacturing share of GDP as much as possible, would you recommend that to a country like China as well? That even if you get wealthier, um, don't give up on manufacturing, don't let it hollow out. So, so I think you can always move the value chain, right? So I, I, you know, again, there's a personal view of them, or I would say that in countries like China and India, where you have a large population, you have a lot of youth looking for jobs, just focusing on services may not do it for you. So you have to think in terms of the, 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 I, I think some of the work we have done, in fact, we're continuing to do more work to see, including in the India context, to see whether, what is the, the multiple effect of you know focusing on manufacturing and services, you clearly see the employment impact is quite significant. So I don't think countries have that choice. Again, this is a very personal view. We're, look, we're trying to do the research here uh, that you have to uh, focus on both manufacturing. You don't. I don't see why you have to do one versus the other. Maybe you have a comparative advantage. India has a comparative advantage in services. At the same time, you also have a large labor force. You do have. Uh, you do have. Uh, a good platform to be manufacturing hub, right? If you do address some key reforms like labor markets, land, and so on, you could still be a, a, a place, a platform for manufacturing activity. So I think that holds. So I would not, I would not, um, I would say that you can do both. I think it, to me, it's a little bit of a false debate. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very interesting uh, piece of observation, Krishna. And I think there's definitely a lot more work to be done given Asia going in myriad directions. Some countries are aging. Some countries are youthful. Some countries are very vulnerable to climate change. Some countries have the great power rivalry to deal with. Krishna, I don't know if my listeners appreciate it, but I know how many different directions an APD director gets pulled. So I'm extremely grateful that you took an hour of your time to spend with me and my listeners. So thank you so much. You're welcome, Timur. Always good to see you. Always good to talk to you about issues. When I come to Singapore, we can exchange ideas on what we can do more in APD. 
Absolutely. And I'll see you in Washington, hopefully in April during the spring meetings. Uh, I'd like to conclude by thanking our listeners. Uh, Kobe Time was produced by Ken Delbridge. Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee provided additional assistance. This podcast is for information only and does not offer any investment advice. All 94 episodes of Kobe Time are available on YouTube and all major platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications and webinar recordings, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.